So welcome to the Get an Unfair Advantage in Network Marketing podcast. Um, here with an absolutely amazing guest this evening, Clay, and it's Clay Brewer, uh, a lawyer, a young lawyer, who's one of the best writers I've ever read about network marketing. Welcome to the show, Clay. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to have you here because I know that a lot of people are going to get an insight into, uh, well, what makes network marketing tick from a legal standpoint. And, you know, it's good to know what we should be concerned about, what we should be looking for, because this can be quite an, a, a nice career, even if it's only a side hustle. And I think a lot of people would benefit from knowing whether they're getting involved with something that's going to have longevity or unlikely to have longevity, if that makes sense to you, Clay. It does. Absolutely. I, I would agree. Yeah, yeah. I like the, the word side hustle. And that's the most important thing that we should always hammer home because um, that kind of keeps the income claims at bay mm. and things like that. I mean, what may come out of it, um, it may be astronomical, which is fantastic. Great for those individuals. Um, right. But you don't want to sell it in a way that that's going to take right. you for, for lack of a better term. Right. Well, let me tell you a story, Clay. I've been doing this a long time here in, in Canada where I am. Obviously, you're in the States, and, and uh, uh, most of my most of people that follow my podcast are, too. But up here in Canada, we had a, a, a real estate boom in the early 90s and uh, a bust, and interest rates went sky high, and things were tough, especially in the Toronto area where I live. And uh, there was an article in the national newspaper in Canada called The Globe and Mail in 1992. And it talked about the fact that we had the highest rate of bankruptcies that cost the loss of the personal uh, residence, right? Cost the loss of the home. Mm -hmm. And it said in it that burned into my brain cells. It said 93% of the homes that were lost to bankruptcy during this tough time because interest rates went up could have been saved for the want of an additional $500 a month of income. And that blew my mind. It adds because, up, yeah. Because to me, $500 worth of, you know, side hustle money is easy to make. Or, or you know, achievable. Let's put it that way. More realistic than millions that you might see on, on Facebook or Twitter or something. I agree. Right. So I keep telling that story today. And I say today that number is somewhere between $1,000 and $2,000 a month. And that's changing. You know, if you got that kind of money coming in as a side hustle, it it you're no longer struggling to pay the bills, right? At least hopefully least not, you, right? At least you can keep your uh, yeah head above water, hopefully. Yeah, it's yeah. Great, I mean, so. If you lose your job, I mean, it's good to have the side hustle there. But yeah, as long as you don't lose your job, your head should be above water, and that's really a great focus. If people really want to plug along in this business. And build it up more than that. Well, great. That just takes right. some more time and doing more of what they did to get between a thousand and two thousand, right? Maybe their next goal is, I don't know, four thousand or three thousand dollars a right. month. You Set know? those achievable um, hurdles as opposed to the astronomical things. And on day 60, don't get too uh, demoralized at the outset. Um, exactly. I, I had a really good friend of mine the other day. We were kind of talking about the industry. And I think that the best thing is that you sell hope, not some mm. lofty uh, acquisition of Ferraris or, or jets or, or right. even the high thousands or, or millions of dollars, of course. So you want to really just keep it constrained to and sell a, real, a realistic outcome. Because if, yeah. if you have to put a blindfold over someone's eyes to kind of recruit them into a system or something like that, then you're already starting off on bad footing. And you don't want to be somewhere where you have to kind of tiptoe around the truth of what you're actually doing to get someone to join um, your opportunity or, or buy your products. You want them to genuinely enjoy it, enjoy the community, and then uh, show what comes of that, comes of it, right? Yeah, so that would be deceptive, wouldn't it, right? Because we both correct, know that yeah. the number of people that end up with six figures a month from network marketing are pretty slim. Yeah, so they're they're, they're exist, existing. But that shouldn't be the like, the beacon of hope that you're looking for. You should look for, like you said, the individual that, that might be able to pay a car bill that week. And, of course, how you phrase it is very 
in particular, especially here in the United States with the Federal Trade Commission and things like that. But mm -hmm. uh, kind of, again, sign that hope of you, you might not get what your goals are, but hopefully you can find uh, maybe a, a purpose in what you're doing from the day to day. And again, what comes of that purpose, the sky's the limit potentially. Um, but you just don't want to promise those hard number figures right. or, or success because more than likely, unfortunately, uh, you won't reach those numbers. And I mean, human nature, I'm, I'm the same way. You never think that you're the average person, right? You always think that you'll achieve above expectations. Um, but unfortunately, the average exists because individuals do fall in those averages. Yeah. And one of the things that we teach, which is extremely important, is that those goals are not achievable unless you learn skills. So if you want to get between a thousand and two thousand or maybe slightly over two thousand dollars a month of, of, of real, you know, money that comes in every month, you know, and. Uh, yeah, you got to replace a few people that, that stop buying, which we call attrition. But mm -hmm. if, if you want to be at that level of income, you better learn how to talk to people. Right. And, and so, so you'll like me because that's the way I lead with everything. But I also mm -hmm. want to be sure that people understand what the law is and what the ramifications of the law is and, and how to pick a good business opportunity and how to stay away from the ones that that are obviously not doing it right. And, and that's why I'm so glad to have a specialist attorney in network marketing like you at, uh, on the show. And I'm going to say one more thing, and I hope your head doesn't explode. But I see you as the future of, you know, one of the leaders of this industry uh, in the future uh, from a legal standpoint. And so uh, well, I appreciate that because I think it, I think it's very important because I mean before I start working at Thompson Burton with Ke alongside Kevin Thompson who's well there as well mm -hmm. you kind of have those negative connotations of the industry but then you meet the entrepreneurs you meet the people that want to do it right right and there is an avenue but unfortunately uh, you have one bad article one bad documentary or something and that gets the headlines and then you right take network marketing and MLM which are viable legitimate businesses right um, and you you like pair them with pyramids and ponzi's and things like that and unfortunately right. become synonymous even though they're not and so it's my goal to to teach individuals that one they're not one and the same and then two there's a way to do it right you just have to want to and maybe not look at your neighbor who might not be doing it correctly because eventually they're gonna, they're gonna they're gonna find you i mean you yeah they are eventually now, but eventually it's gonna come uh back to haunt you and and those are the ones we want to stop because it causes bigger issues for those who want to do it right, like I've said. Right. A lot of people end up getting involved in something like that. And then when it's taken apart, what happens is that they don't come back to the industry. They would, it was all smoke and mirrors or deceptive marketing or whatever we want to call it, you know, bad actors. And it, they leave and it, it causes what I like to call, we leave dead bodies behind us, right? Not literally. Fortunately, good news does not sell as well as bad news. As much as we want it to, it, it just won't. So yeah. you have to navigate those muddy waters as well. So I want to hit on actual cases with your permission, going all the way back to Glenn Turner and uh, Coscott International. And of course, he was, uh, before that, well, he was involved in Holiday Magic. And he was quite a character. Uh, and, and bring it all the way back to, uh, you know, the recent Nolan, uh, FTC versus Nolan and SBH or Success by Health mm -hmm. and, and get you to tell everybody, because I'm not an attorney, mm -hmm. even though I've been following this stuff for a long time and wrote about it excessively in Network Marketing News, you know, NetworkMarketingNews.com, which I ran for nine years. Uh, and before that, and since then, I've kept up with it. You're the expert, not not myself. And so, if you if you if we can get right into those cases, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. But to kind of start, I think a premise behind all these cases would be that regulators, the goalposts keep moving. And so, yes, we have case law, we have settlements. I'm not going to go into further detail about the distinction between that, if you like, but. You can even, like you said, be an, be an expert uh, in the industry or kind of know all these cases and, and the facts uh, front and back of everything. But 
the operational realities and how the FTC, for example, views a company can change from uh, right. case to case, from right. company to company, and just kind of how they feel on that day, unfortunately. So it's important to have these key aspects in mind. Um, but as uh, I always tell clients, it's impossible in this industry to give a stamp of approval. Even if we right. wanted to, it's right. just you can look great on paper, but then have um, – horrible record keeping or, or just right. poor uh, execution. And that, that'll that right. go a long way as well. Yeah, you could have a big heart, mean well, and still still be in trouble with the FTC. So you right. listen to that, people. If anybody ever tells you that some law firm has said that they're legal and they're ethical, you, you pretty much stop right there. That, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I can't speak for other firms, but I know that me personally and also Kevin, is we do say you can operate um, – Mm. We say like the most as far as I'll go is you have the uh, potential based on what you've provided us or, or how we view your model and things. But until you have sufficient like customer data um, right, and how you execute the model is a big thing. And then secondly, it even goes deeper that even if you have a great model and you have numerous customers, um, the one, if you can't prove that fact, then it's mm -hmm. pretty much – as if you're not doing it anyway. So yeah, it's extremely right. important to be able to prove and contrary yeah. to the, the nefarious meanings that might, regulators might try to portray in your company. As we used to say, if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. And sometimes when it's written down, it still didn't happen, but yeah, the yeah. different world of law, right? Now we don't want to scare people. It's great that, that Clay came out here and told the truth. The goalposts move a little bit. Someone, you know, the same person has been running the FTC since it started. It, you know, the people change, the, the head of the FTC is going to change, the, the, the perception of network marketing by the head, current head of the FTC and the people that are doing investigations is going to be different. So the goalposts are going to move a little bit, but we believe there's a lot of hope to talk about in this industry, don't we, Clay? I agree. And I think it all goes back to, again, the, the administration has changed. Uh, already changed. Like right now, the FTC is more focused on antitrust and big tech and things like that. So that might uh, put things to the wayside for network marketing and everything. But it all goes back to, like you said, uh, the Costco case, right. where it's a payment of money and you earn rewards unrelated to product sales. That's pretty much really right. boiling it down to right. the simplicity. Um, most so two parts, right? Correct. Two you elements. Pay for the right to be able to represent the company, and you get paid when somebody else pays for the right to, to represent the company. Is that, is that close in, in enough? In short, yeah. So Costco yeah. in 1975 said that a pyramid scheme like breaks down to those two elements. So you pay, most companies have some kind of enrollment fee. And so everyone's going to satisfy that first element, right? That's Because that's, right. you want to have that customer distributor distinction. And so I even advise clients to, to have to, to satisfy a part of a test you want to make sure that you have that distinction between customers and distributors. So that takes us right. to the second element for pretty much every company. Um, and that's rewards unrelated to product sales. And right. so obviously if I'm selling, if I recruit you, Steve, and you pay a $99 enrollment fee, and then I get 40 bucks of that enrollment fee, that's no right. products exchanged. Hand. That's just me recruiting you who then might recruit um, someone else. Correct? Yeah. So Clint, let's say, Let's say for sake of argument, uh, there's an alternate reality that you and I are involved in and I run into you at a party. And I, I start talking and you say you're a lawyer. What kind of law do you practice? And then it comes out that you're in the direct selling industry and you're an expert in network marketing. I, I get all excited. Wow, Clay, no way. I'm starting a network marketing company. I've got this great idea, Clay. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to charge everybody 50 bucks, uh, administrative fee, you know, to sign up. In the company, and then I'm going to pay $25 to every person who they sign up, uh, pay them $25 to every person they sign up uh, out of the administrative fee, because then I'll be able to keep the price of my products low. And oh, that's going to be great, man. And then you'd have to tell me. That's unfortunate. That's illegal. That's textbook pyramiding. And so you want to, the product is. So you have to have a bona fide, genuine product that, that has retail value. And then. And that's going on in a huge way right now in one particular company. We don't mention company names, only about past cases because they're already public. And, you know, so bingo. The cost cut, per the cost cut test, that would fail, right? 
Correct. If you're paying by administrative fees. Now there can be nuances of um, the digital age, uh, social media. There are different products that might not be considered the, the textbook like lotions, potions, pills that the mm -hmm. old school um, mm -hmm. network marketing companies have of like garage full of, of products. Um, but there has to be a bona fide product, whether real or physical. Um, yeah. And the key test to that is do individuals that are not enrolled within your opportunity find it valuable? Right. If the answer is no, then you need to uh, do some soul searching because you really don't have bona fide non-distributor customers. You're not going to end up with at least 50% of the revenue coming from people that are not in participants in the plan. Right. And, you know, we, we know that that's been laid out in a number of legal cases. In fact, asked Herbalife for 66%, didn't they? Right. Yeah, and they're under a recent settlement. They're under a settlement from 2016, I believe the year is, um, and they are required to, I believe, don't quote me on this, but they they have a set percentage. I think 80 percent has to be from customers that are not right. distributors in the company, and and they're still excelling, which is which is great. And so, so whenever an executive or a company says that, oh, we have to force our distributors to purchase a certain amount of product to survive, uh, I would push back on that a bit further. Maybe there's a deeper issue that you're just not wanting to mm -hmm. bring to the open at this time. So. Yeah, yeah. So I, I actually heard Kevin Thompson, who you work with on a show, um, he, when when Herbalife came up, he said, yeah, and they, they met the conditions of the $200 million settlement, and, and he said that proved that they weren't an illegal pyramid. Mm -hmm. Yep, and they're still operating. So, I mean, people might have different... Uh, interpretation of it, but under the rules of that settlement, they're still a successful public company. And so they have even more stringent conditions than an ordinary private company may have. Now, and, back in the day, um, sorry, some pie got delivered. Next no worries. Here. Uh, uh, back in the day when products and services really had to be sold to a direct distributor who then sold it to another distributor who then sold it to the customer because the company had no low cost way of shipping goods direct right uh, this is before fedex and ups and, you know back in the day amway kind of did a, the industry a huge favor and stood up to the ftc in the 1979 proved that network marketing was legal but we do know nowadays that that precedent doesn't really apply does it clay that's correct. So these are known as the Amway safeguards, as um, we discussed in the past. I'm sure most of our audience uh, has heard to some degree. Um, if you haven't, you're probably a distributor who has read the policies and procedures of your company and may see a provision that references the 70% rule. And so that's kind of where the original term distributor comes from, because like you said, the, pro the product from a company would be shipped to an individual who distributed it to individuals like in their kind of network, right? Right. With the age of direct fulfillment, you don't really have that middleman anymore. And so right. the term distributor has been maintained in, in certain companies. Mm -hmm. You also have associates, ambassadors, brand partners, right. and the like. Um, right. But sometimes, it, or a lot of the time, some uh, individuals like brand partners or whatever never have to actually touch product in order to earn commissions on those sales because it'll be through an affiliate link, Mm. direct fulfillment from a warehouse of the company straight to the customer or whatever. Um, the only time it would come would be maybe an internal consumption, which is uh, personal purchasing. Mm. And then you can then sell to individuals if you so choose as well. Um, but the 70% so should... rule does not really apply anymore, even though yeah. a lot of policy procedures still maintain it because it just became a safeguard that more like boilerplate language um, in today's and age. Yeah, we really do owe Amway a, a debt of gratitude for proving the network marketing is legal. But I, I think that brings us all the way up to Burn Lounge, doesn't it? I mean, that was that was when the new model was applied, where you know people didn't have to hand off product to people, and 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 the FTC proved that Burn Lounge was an illegal pyramid. Please talk about that. Yeah, so Burn Lounge was a case in 2015, and so we're now in the internet. A lot of things have changed. Uh, it kind of applied to music, but not to get into the nuances in the weeds of the individual case. The biggest thing focused on the value of the product. And so as we discussed previously, if an individual outside of the opportunity does not find value in that product, right. then that raises immediate concerns that individuals are just purchasing 
to then recruit others who purchase, to then recruit others who purchase. And that, that gives a bad taste in a regulator's mouth, of course, because if you don't have genuine customers, then if the commission structure were to go away, then more than likely your business would collapse because revenue would be uh, pretty much zero. We and call so, those internally, you know, within the industry, correct. a lot of people call that the money game. Right. It's and an so, excuse to make money. The product's the excuse to make money. Exactly. And so people were buying it not particularly to use uh, this access to music and things like that, but more so to have the right to recruit others who then did the same, um, regardless of whether they used the actual product or not for whatever it was being used for. Yeah. And the Burn Lounge Court actually um, raised a really interesting thing that then was brought up recently in the FTC versus Nolan and Success by Health case. Is I'll say this very slowly because I sometimes get confused trying to say it, but hmm. just because a product value does not mean that a pyramid does not exist. On the flip side, just because a product is valueless does not mean that a pyramid does exist. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. So it's how the payment structure and everything works and why the people are buying the products because customers will define the value of the product. And so as lawyers, I rarely uh, comment on a company's product value. I mean, there's right. going to be a market for something somewhere probably, but you want to know the biggest distinction is individuals that are enrolled in the opportunity, are they the only ones purchasing it? That's an issue. If 50%, there's no real fine, 50% in a feather or more um, purchase it outside of the opportunity, then that's a good argument that there is value. Um, mm -hmm. Now you can get into the weeds and that can be more of a, a factual dispute going beyond that. But I think that's right. a good initial start of what that case established. Yeah, the majority of the income cannot be from uh, internal consumption and yeah uh, i hate that term but yeah it, you know, it's tough yeah the participants are, are the only ones that are consuming or the majority of the ones consuming the product right so that brings me to something else that's been bugging me a lot and i know you and i touched on it briefly when we you know when we were talking the other day and that is you know things like memberships obviously a membership can be a legal and ethical product um right. No question about it, yeah. No question there at all. But if we create a membership and we tell people, hey, the membership is the product, and the participants, I, you know, it's mostly participants, which would offend the pyramid rule, but, <laughs> you know, uh, if, 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 the, if they're not using that membership to actually make purchases, and you came back with an example, and I, I think it was Zeke, rewards or something but so i'll put this another way if we're saying that the uh membership is the product and that product is to buy you know it's a, a fee you pay to buy products at a, a, a discounted rate which is costco basically that's mm -hmm. costco's model but nobody's buying product yeah without knowing further and diving deep into like the specifics of the hypothetical and things like that um, that that does kind of mirror the Zeke Rewards case. And so a membership, the premise, can can be a product. Undoubtedly, it's mm -hmm. not an enrollment fee. It's not to join the opportunity. It's just a membership to enjoy certain discounts with companies, individuals, et cetera, who may be a part of this network that I'm joining. No right. problems there. The biggest issue that Zeke Rewards kind of fell into, and I'll just use as a, like a, an example that we've come across mm -hmm. has been to the ringer of the FTC and things like that is it was a penny auction. And so individuals were buying bids, but never using those bids to buy product. It was just more bids. And so I would buy bids and then I would recruit you, Steve, who bought more bids and I would get a percentage of like my commissions are derived from the bids that you purchased, regardless of the auction actually being utilized. Um, that's where the nuance and kind of the, the stickiness of that kind of example would, would come into play. Yeah. So I'm going to give you your favorite lawyer answer. If it depends on the particular facts, that, right? But if no one's using the membership or digital offering or whatever is being offered to actually uh, then use that for something else, then it might it might be an issue to, to dive deeper in. Yeah, it smells bad, right? It, it wouldn't look excuse. good. Yeah, it uh, might just be excuse to make money, right? Uh, that's all. Right. Yeah. 
it really okay. depends. And that's very fact specific. Yeah. As I said, it can be it can be very um, nice on its face, but then when you dive into the operational realities of an individual company or individual uh, fact pattern, it could then uh, many assumptions that you have can go right quite quickly, as you can yeah. imagine. Yeah, I, and and that's why I wanted to bring it up is that, but you're the attorney, and I right. That's really why record to... keeping and uh, very stringent compliance is a must in this industry. There's no I launched yesterday, so now I'm good to go going forward uh, being a ceo or, or executive any company especially in this industry as highly regulated as it is um it's unfortunately not a science it's more of an art in, in how you practice it so yeah i i concur with that that brings me right segues perfectly into my next question on july 19th you wrote you you wrote three quick uh bullet down all those all that legalese down to three quick points. And number two was you have to promote customer acquisition. I and mean, I should probably make that number one because the more yeah. you talk to people, the more that really is what matters. Right. Uh, and unfortunately, even internal consumption isn't considered a, a classification of a customer. I, I personally disagree with it, but yeah, I, I don't do write too. the laws. I don't enforce the, the laws. And so I only help individuals navigate these waters. So, this is your sandbox, people. You right. don't have to play outside of it to make money. <laughs> right. Exactly. I, I agree with that because that's when it gets uh, very, very tough. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, when, and again, when it says customer acquisition, it means non-distributor customers. So even if a distributor is purchasing it, unfortunately, regulators are moving in a direction where they do not interpret those as being customers. And, and Lewis Cash actually asked that question. Thank you, Lewis re internal consumption question mark mm -hmm. and when we we're saying internal consumption we're talking about the independent representatives of the company and the product they buy for themselves correct and it, it, and a very very good rule of thumb is 50 percent's got to be outside of that but here's how you can pick a company and whether they what they're doing makes sense are they setting some kind of requirement for you to rank advance Right. You got to have this many customers before you can rank advance, right? Or this many customers before right. you can earn that bonus, right? Right. If they're not doing that, well, we can't say for sure it's an illegal pyramid, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even make that uh, jump. Like, it's not the next logical leap of any monthly volume requirements or anything to consider you to be a pyramid or for it to even be illegal or anything right. to that effect. But it, it does kind of you want to dive deeper into why that may be the case. Um, I've, I've heard kind of through the ether, a lot of companies will say, well, if we got rid of that factor, then maybe our sales would drop. Well, that's that's an issue because that means you might be lacking customers. Um, it's not saying you're op operating illegally. It's not saying there's an issue mm -hmm. there at all. But as a company executive, have that concern. It warrants diving deeper um, into yeah. who's actually purchasing it and why. For example, if you have $100 that has to be spent every month, are all of your distributors buying on the 30th and 31st of the month and only right. at 100 105 or right. is it varying based upon actual need and um, personal use? Right, right. So it's really fascinating stuff. I mean, I think all the time about this stuff and I think, well, you know, maybe the price of your product's too high and that's the reason why you don't you can't keep customers right why you have customer um, acquisition the opposite of acquisition attrition uh, I'm attrition sorry, sorry right. I, I, my brain went uh yeah so that's why you got such high attrition rates with your non-internal consumption right right that's, <laughs> that's a nice way to phrase it yeah yeah so maybe that's what's at fault. So when you say you got to dive deeper, those are the things you're looking at, right? Like, why aren't you keeping customers? It's got to be, is it the quality of the product? Is it the cost of the product? You know, it's non-competitive. Mm -hmm. What's the issue? Is it something that's too expensive for the average person to purchase? Um, you know, and I look at them all the time. They take off these deals. Business opportunities. Sorry, I call them deals sometimes. Uh, no worries. Um, and yeah. uh, I'm looking at it, going, that doesn't make sense at all. I mean, 140 bucks a month per person for a product that nobody bought before that company came along. Um, what? Yeah. 
<laughs> again, it could be an issue, but just like I said, it's warrants diving deeper. And what I mean by that is if you're a distributor, talk to your upline, ask how they're doing things, um, reach out to the company. I mean, there might be a bit of a, a barrier between the executives and the company, but be a part of the solution to grow the industry in the right direction because it can start with you. And I think that's very important to, to have that um, two-way street to to see what might be going on because I think sometimes – a lot of company executives get disconnected from their sales force. And then on the, on the flip side, I think a lot of the sales force get disconnected from the company, break away, and then turn into the anti-MLM crowd. And I think that's maybe from a bad experience and maybe from a disconnect and mm. um, conversation. And so when I say dive deeper, it's just ask questions and just know how you want to succeed and how individuals succeed. And then you can maybe shed light on that with your own interpretation. Yeah, I mean, Lewis just wrote a note here in the chat. He said, so customer acquisition would be most important focus to stay above bar. More training on how to grow customer base would be very key. I concur with that. I, I did want to say, as you were talking, that uh, Mark Hughes used to travel with Jim Rohn and they used to go city to city and do a show and they were very in touch with their distributors. I think after Mark passed away, unfortunately, and at a very young age, it was 44. After that, after he was gone, I felt like the company got a little disconnected from, from the field. And mm. uh, again, I've never been in Herbalife, but of course I knew quite a few people who were and in writing network marketing news for years and years and years. I talked to everybody and I, I really agree with that, Clay. Mm -hmm. I also agree, agree with your statement that, that distributors can be a part of the solution. Independent reps, the small guy can be a part of the solution. And if the company's not focused on customer acquisition, there are other companies out there that are focused on customer acquisition. Mm -hmm. um, so the ultimate bottom line is if you can't get answers from your upline in your company, there are other, you know, you don't, you're not a, you're not a tree. Sure. Yeah. And the wind blows, you can move. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I, like you said, kind of establish that personal connection with individuals. Don't just think that uh, sales will come to you. And, and I would like to believe that if something's too good to be true, it probably is. Mm -hmm. So that's why I always give advice to companies to sell hope and sell the mission and, and the promise that you have. And I like to always say promises made, promises kept. Because what good does it make making all these promises? And then no one that joins your company uh, ever reaches any of these even minor or lofty goals that you set for them. That's where the, the disconnect, like I've said, and right. the um, malcontent kind of comes into play. Right, right. hundred percent. Yeah. If you have to, again, if you have to sugarcoat something, uh, then there might be something you need to dive deeper on as a company um, and look internally, because if you have to lie to get people in, then there might be deeper issues. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I put close to a thousand people in this industry personally. Oh, now I've been around a long time, so that sounds like a lot. Please understand when you're listening, I don't work that hard and I don't have to anymore. But um, I would say, you know, that if you ask people when you're talking to what kind of additional income would change their lives? Most of, excuse me, most of them are not going to say $100,000 a month. Right. It'd be nice, but that's not, that's not the average guy. I agree. Yeah. So why don't we sell them what they can believe? Mm -hmm. By the way, there's a huge issue in selling what people can't believe. And when you're dealing with somebody with mad skills, who's been around a long time, really is good at talking. Um, they can, they can be actually it's harder for someone like that to be successful than mm -hmm. it is for somebody who doesn't, you know, bring that to the table. So right. I agree. if you're making a hundred thousand dollars a month, guys, it's tougher to go out in the field and say, Hey, I want to help you pay some bills. Hard to right? connect with that individual. Yeah. You, you, you're like, they're looking at you going, Oh my gosh. Right. Um, but I would say this to the few, if you are one of those people who wants to earn mid five figures, you know, kind of thing, 
uh, you're going to have a lot of people you need to talk to who need 2000 mm -hmm. and you really need to present what they are looking for and allow them to change their perception of themselves through experience, not go at them like they should be looking to make $50,000 a month or 25 yeah. or whatever. I would agree to that. Yeah, absolutely. Start with realistic goals. And like I said, if something comes of it, fantastic. If not, then you didn't oversell. Again, going back to promises made. Uh, promises kept and it's mm. very important to understand are are these individuals selling a product and teaching you how to sell this product or are you for lack of a better term becoming the product just because they're recruiting you i mean it's yeah. it's very disheartening to see some individual there who teach certain things and then they make the money off of teaching you not actually doing what they're teaching you so yeah. that's something right. that kind of drives me a bit a bit crazy Right, right. There's course sellers out there that are doing that right now. I mean, they'll build up a following, dump their course on them. Most of the people that buy the course can't do what, what the course, what they did, which is in the course. So as a result, those people stop following the individual, mm -hmm. right? Their followers disappear, which we right. won't do on this podcast ever or on smilingsteve.com. We're never going to do that. Yeah. Um, yep. Which is fine. There's a lot of legitimate things out there, but it only take again, like I said at the outset of the uh, the conversation, it only takes one, and then the entire yeah. industry can collapse because of that and it's, one. It's uh, going on all the market. time. I mean, I, there's people out there. I saw an advertisement on Facebook today. Uh, she has a thousand customers, and she's enrolled 246 distributors, and you know this new advertising concept. Well, I know what the advertising concept is. I wrote a book about it. It's called The Free Cheese Secret. By the way, don't buy their course because you can have my book for free. Here's the reality. How much was the spend? What was the ad spend to create? So I saw another another group, uh, uh, sorry, another person from the same group, and they're going, in my first 30 days, blah, blah, this happened, this happened. No, it's all down to the advertising. Wow, you got to try this out. Okay. So you enrolled 61 distributors in a month. How do you train all of those people? Mm -hmm. Um, and what was the ad spend? Because if you blew $10,000 to get 61 distributors in, it ain't looking so good, right? right? Yeah. But now, of course, this is what, what do you call that? Deceptive marketing? What do you call it? Yeah, misleading deceptive. There's a variety of rules. That's more of the legal parlance of it, correct? Yeah. Right, right. So take a look at your own life. You know, again, if it's too good to be true, just... I'm going to keep harping on this. Dive deeper into it. Um, don't think you're going to make uh, X amount of money overnight because there are no overnight successes, no matter how uh, prominent social media and stuff might make it. And so if you, if you take control of which companies you join and how you go about it, then I think you'll be much better off mm -hmm. to succeed or fail. Yeah, 100%. If you've done the research. Um, you weren't trying for that quick buck because I see a lot of people that try to jump ship all the time. Uh, for that next big thing, that next big buck, but um, there's no well, timing, timing's a myth, isn't it? It really mm -hmm. is. I mean, it, you still don't know how to recruit a lot of people. So, what difference does it make if you jump into a brand new business opportunity? Mm -hmm. You right. know, yeah. so it's like you, you know, the definition of insanity you, you keep on doing the same thing and you expect different results. There's so, a lot of factors that goes into it, whereas it might just appear as if it's one or two. It's it's a variety of different things that that uh, lead up to success. Yeah, yeah. Skills being very important. Also, understanding whether you're in a good business, and that's why I wanted to have Clay here. We're so fortunate to have Clay as a guest. Uh, I can't tell you um, because I've never talked to anybody with more experience and you know more. Sorry, not experience. Uh, um, a better ability uh, of, of conveying the legal concerns, Clay. I, I really respect you a lot. And I'll tell you, you know, after, you know, I knew Jerry Nira really well and Babner passed away, Jeffy Babner, who I'd known for years from the MLMIA, Multi-Level Marketing International Association, we used to go to their conventions. I met Rod Cook here, uh, who's the MLM dog. I met him there and he just passed away a year ago, a year and a half ago. Um, but I think your firm might be the top network marketing firm in the United States. Like eh, there's a couple of them there. I, I don't know. What do you, you, you guys think you're the best or what? 
I, I enjoy what I do, and I think that if an individual uh, loves the work that they do, and I love working with Kevin Thompson, he's one of the best in my opinion. Mm. I think that our work shows that we that we enjoy what we do. Yeah, it sure, so it sure that's, does. That's a big thing because we, we really believe in the industry. Yeah. And it, it's at a crossroads right now, I think. I think there's a lot of opportunity for individuals, but I think the, the negative connotations have to be um, dispersed from. That's why I'm so passionate about trying to bring more content, kind of educate individuals, distributors, and companies alike. And hopefully uh, individuals learn just a little bit of knowledge um, each time I write or each time I speak, and, and they can take it to to their teams or to their companies. And if they have any questions, feel free to reach out because yeah, I think the passion definitely shows at our firm. Yeah, yeah, 100%, Clay. And we'll promote your your writing because I, like, I think it's the top drawer. I got one more question for you. And you sure. might want to add some stuff that, you know, I haven't brought up. Yeah. You already you covered a few of my questions before I even had a chance to ask them, which is great. Reef, mm -hmm. why are they important? So it, it really comes to twofold. So you have the customers, then you have the distributors that are in the opportunity. Uh, customers is really left to the individual business based upon the product, based upon like foliation, can it, can it go bad and things like that. Um, we like to see 30 days just because that kind of gives an individual enough time to test the products and you don't I mean it's, it's up to the company really when it comes to customers in short the biggest factor and a lot of states have rules when it comes to distributors so when it comes to uh, the enrollment fees for example or when it comes to internal consumption uh, a lot of the states want you to refund fees depending on what state you're in uh, based on x amount of days if an individual decides to cancel decide it's not for them give them a right, right, right of rescission or whatever correct yeah just mm. don't don't buy one hundred bucks. Just don't don't be that company. It it's, mm. doesn't uh, promote success really or, or positive business keeping really. Um, the most important thing is when you have internal consumption. Let's say that an individual again, this has kind of changed a bit from direct fulfillment and everything. Mm -hmm. But if you buy a thousand or two thousand dollars worth of product and you have it in your garage, and then you quit your company, it, it's it's good business practice to purchase back resellable product. That right. you can then resell to others because you don't want to stuck with the product uh, because the number one issue of why regulators state and federal like um, come to the attention of your business is based on consumer complaints and that's whether through tina.org which is truth and advertising they'll bring it to their attention um, and in a variety of different avenues like the triple b um, the better business bureau um, right they're not just perusing the web i mean they do some i suppose they're not just like Googling MLM companies and looking to, to attack. Right. Uh, it derives from consumer harm because that, that is what regulators such as the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Federal Trade Commission really um, base their mission upon is, is alleviating consumer harm. Mm. So yeah. Have that in mind um, when denying or, or promoting a re refund and return policy. Yeah, so the refund's really important to uh, 100%. There's laws around it, guys, and, and also complaints cause the company to be inspected. Really Correct. don't want that. Right. I mean, complaints are the biggest thing. I mean, you can't, by nature of being a business in America or any location, really, Canada as well, you're going to get complaints. But how you handle those complaints and what's causing those complaints is really the biggest factor to keep in mind. Just putting a note out to the few people that are on the call as your insiders with me just to see if they have any more questions. Clay, what didn't I touch base on? I think the most what important I ask? Yeah, I think the most important thing right now is to focus on income claims. So it kind of mm. we kind of touched on it tangentially, such as I always use uh like and Kevin uses it as well, the promises made, promises kept. Um just don't don't lie about how much money you can make. I've I've seen companies where they have a very um, robust compensation plan, but no one's hit the top fifty percent of it. And so, if no one's ever earned those monies, then don't put it in any of your any of your statements or any of your documents because it's not outcome. Um, so the biggest thing is to provide the typical results of the ordinary individual in your company. What are they expected to make? So if I were to join your company today, what can I, through reasonable efforts, of course, luck, timing, and everything come into play, but what can I expect to make? It's not going to be driving a Ferrari in a year, right? 
So that's the most important thing. Um, 200, 500, a side hustle is the terminology that I love right. to use. Yeah, me too. Stay away from financial freedom. Stay away from quitting your day job, quitting your nine to five. If it happens, fantastic. But don't make that a selling point to get uh, a single mother of four to enroll in your company, for example. You know, um, right. There's a, there's a very fine line and distinction there. So just be open about your business, open about what individuals can earn. And it's great to see success, but do not promise success just by nature of joining your company. Yeah, you know, I'm always concerned when I look at a company that does not publish average income earnings. Correct. The income disclosure statement is an absolute necessity. If a company does not have that, um, I would strongly recommend executives listening to create one and right. distributors to reach out to your company management or compliance team and ask for it. Or yeah, yeah. Hey, where is it? We need right. it, right? It, it is a requirement because we've seen um, income claims are an origination of these complaints right. that the regulators and stuff tackle. Right. We've also seen income claims be in complaints when they sue companies. Right. They then get under the hood, and that's where the pyramiding will kind of be a back door to get to those arguments. And so right. these are very low hanging fruit for regulators uh, to then get into the uh, under the hood of your company and really find maybe some deeper issues. Again, there might not be, but. If I'm not mistaken, that was part of the business opportunity rule that went into effect in 2013 to a requirement to have. It is, yes, but MLMs, it's a fine line between business opportunities right. and network marketing. And right. so they're not an exception It's or an exemption, really. It's kind of a understood mm -hmm. not falling under that rule right now. Um, there right. are some heated regulatory talks of them trying to get ML multi-level marketing and network marketers back under that rule. Um, but, but yes, the business opportunity rule in itself does require extensive uh, disclosure documents prior to someone enrolling. Yeah, and yeah. It's good I, practice, I, you know? It's just good practice to be open and honest about what your business is doing. Right, right. And if you have to mislead people to get them into your business, there's something wrong. on a business you want to be a part of. Right, 100%. Thank you for stating that. Uh, you don't want to be a part of that. Um, and this yeah. is someone who is passionate and, and pro industry saying this. And so, right, right, right. I'm not I trying mean, to scare anyone away, but I mean, it's, it's a very simple task and it's very easy to do. Right. We help clients every day do this. And so we know what it takes to be successful and what it, what's needed to make it work. But mm -hmm. you have to be willing to, to play that game and, and put in the, the hard work. Well, I've got a story for everybody. When I came back to network marketing, I had a very unfortunate experience uh, that, they, you know, early, in the early 80s, the company I represented uh, in the United States was defrauding the Canadian government when they were sending uh, goods to Canada. And that's that's well documented on the Internet. I'm not going to mention the company name because they're still operating and I don't want to be a part of hurting anybody. So but I left the industry. I was really upset. Um, and, you know, I've got a great ability to talk to people. So I was going to make good money in, in traditional sales anyway. So I left and then I bumped into somebody I knew from the copier industry, photocopier industry in the late eighties. And he had a brand new check in his hand for $44,000 had to come in that morning. Later on, I found out that that check included the what we call uh, open downline, closed downline. It included the commission uh, commissions due to people who had not yet reached the direct level in the comp compensation. Yeah. Understood. So it wasn't his income. And later on, I was able to piece together who was involved with him by meeting everybody and rough estimate of what he actually earned, which was significantly less than 42 or 44,000 or whatever. That guy left the industry. So I'm not hurting him uh, in any way. If this story should get out, he went in training and never came back to uh, the direct selling industry and he continued to be a, a, a good sales trainer. But that was complete, I don't know, totally misleading fraud, I guess. Yeah, uh, to, to an extent, misleading and deceptive is kind of the terms we use in our industry. Mm. Yeah, and, and I agree with all, a lot of the things that individuals have said in the comments as well that I've seen. Focus on where people are, right? And it's kind of like what you've 
kept saying throughout our conversation tonight is the $200 might be great. 50 bucks is great for people. I mean, that's a lot of money right. for a lot of people. Right. So yeah, it's great to see the lofty jets and the cars and the, and the vacations and the things you right. can earn to go or Cancun or Paris or whatever, but, but don't start there. It, it can be maybe a hopeful um, goal. That's, that's a possibility perhaps, but start with someone today. What can, how can you help them today? How would joining your business help today? What, how can they take control of their lives today? I think that's the most important thing to focus in on. Uh, sell a story, but don't sell a false or, or a false expe expectation uh, of a fantasy story, right? 100%, Clay. I'd, I'd rather be the expert at helping people make $1,000 a month than I would be considered the expert of helping people make thousand dollars a month right I mean, because i know average, that for i know that for most people that's never going to happen right i mean for the average american i'm sure it's the same for the average canadian i mean 200 bucks a month extra that's it's right. monumental you know that's a lot of hours of yeah. hard work it's it's 500 um, you know 200 500 thousand whatever it is it, it, it's significant and so help them reach those goals like hey how would it feel to earn 50 bucks this week by having a side hustle yeah alongside your your day job um, yeah. hey the opportunities may be endless but let's start here and if we at. can make this real like how would it feel to you if you could pay for groceries one week from your side hustle yeah one week a month you, you paid your entire grocery bill for your whole family because you had a side hustle yeah and i think that's an appropriate way to frame it because you can talk mm -hmm. in circles when it comes to income claims what right. may or may not be appropriate right it's all about the narrative of how you how you sell it yeah yeah and, and words matter and that's that's something that we teach uh that you know you put it in terms of something that's believable uh and that they can relate to and somebody who's struggling that's you know i mm -hmm. i talked to a girl one time working in a coffee shop and her husband was was a starbucks here in canada and her husband had a full-time job and she whispered to me across the counter, if I cover my mortgage every month, and I think it was like 800 or 900 bucks a month. Or so, mm -hmm. That's what mattered to her, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And I said to her, I think I can help you do that. You know, I, I, I think we can do that if we, if we work together, you know? Right. And, and I knew I could, right? But and, and, you know, so that shows you guys where people's heads are at. Being able to pay the groceries one week a month from your side hustle or pay your mortgage or whatever, or pay your cell phone bill and your internet bill with, with your side hustle, that that's real. A lot of people, whereas when we're talking to them about so-and-so made $16,000 last month, that ain't real for a lot of people. Right. It, it, it may be real for someone, but it's mm -hmm. less realistic for that particular individual at that time mm -hmm. um, and again it goes back to the typicality approach of what is a typical individual that's joined this business expected to earn and right just, and let's for example going back to the income disclosure statements that all companies should have at, mm -hmm. at um if you had this like all these different ranks and different um achievable moments but only one person or zero people actually hit the top mark then why are you showing that? You know, you're, yeah. you're selling reality and a false hope that right. they might get people to join, but when they don't make that million dollars a year or get that car bonus, um, that's when the consumer complaints come, come to, come to right. the forefront. And so if you have a, a kind of expectation of $50, if they make 30, I, I wouldn't think they would no, no, be as no. upset as if they promised a million. Correct. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. And same thing when we put it in terms of like, if you're looking to make 800 a month and you make 500, would you be mad at me? You know, that's something I actually say to people. Like, if you're working towards this, you're getting better at it. I'm helping you, and, and you don't cover your mortgage, but you make five a month. Would you be Would you be upset with me? Right. And right. and they always say you no. Know, you know, and so we'll and we'll work. We'll we'll keep doing those things and get your income up to the point where we do make what you need to make. You know, agree. And now we're we're talking real, and yeah, income disclosure statements. If they're not available from the company, that's that's crazy. Right. And again, we like to always advise clients. So if you're a new company, you're not going to have data to provide. 
but if you've been operational for a year or more, you should have something to right. show someone. And those should be shown to all of your prospects that are being uh, right. welcome to the, to the opportunity, along with the compensation plan uh, and other things such as that. Yeah, I, I think you're right. If you disclose it, why would you be scared of that anyway? You know, if you disclose it, look at how many people we got making two hundred dollars a month. It's crazy, right? Correct. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's not, there's not a lot of people making a hundred thousand a month, but we got a lot of people making, you know, two hundred, five hundred, a thousand. Right. And that's what you're concerned with. Isn't that correct? And they say, Yeah. I said, Well, that's the numbers are right here. Right. So and and you're making it believable. We're getting them there. We work with them. Don't drop people. You've got to help them. Mm -hmm. Have to help them. If they don't have skills, guys, you've got to beg them to please study. You know, uh, what was it? What was it Earl Nightingale said? An hour a day, he said. An hour a day. And look at 15 minutes a day while you're doing your makeup or in the car or in the bus on the way to work or on a break eating lunch with a headset on, 15 minutes a day is enough for you to learn how to talk to people in a way that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, gosh, will you come back sometime? No, absolutely. This has been a block. I could talk all night about this stuff because yeah, it's one thing to be in the, in the legal weeds of stuff, but then when it comes to the maybe operational realities of of the marketplace and learning from people, it, it's changing yeah. your perspective on how to, how, again, how to talk to people, right? I can yeah. be in textbooks all day, but then speaking to people in the field, it, it changes your, your mindset a whole lot. So it's very yeah. important. Yeah, dream building is a big deal, but you got to understand what, you know, what people can accept. You right. know, they cannot accept. They're not going to be, their brain can't get their head, you know, can't get around, you know, the big numbers. Over mm -hmm. time, they can change, but you got to you build a dream that they can believe in. Right. It's always better to over deliver um, and under promise than uh, the opposite, you know. Coded bonuses, are they worth talking about or should we break off for? for, for uh, I mean, we can, we can talk on them. I mean, I, it's pretty much the, the same. Uh, any questions you have, I'm happy to, to answer. Um, but I, th I think they're sufficient. It, just, it all goes back to customer acquisition. So what is really driving right. uh, those commissions? That's really should be the core feature for any any company. Um, no bonus in itself really is per se illegal in my opinion. It's just kind right. of what is what behavior is being driven. Um, some drive recruitment behavior more than others. Right. But it's just like a fast start bonus. bonus. Yeah, fast start bonuses are a very interesting concept that I'd be happy to talk about in another episode or whenever you sure. want to. Just, um, that's something that I could see the FTC may be angling towards with their recent trajectory. Again, mm. it's, it's more of like a one-time thing, so the risk isn't too uh, crazy. But it could be argued that, it, that it's more recruitment-based than not. But it needs to be based upon, I like tying a customer acquisition to any of those. So. You can have a fast start bonus if you recruit Steve, only if he gets two customers kind of thing. That's yeah. then it's being paid off of product sales and, and genuine customer growth. Well, let's do that, Clay. Let's get together in a couple of months or something and we'll talk. Sure, I'd love to. You know, delve, delve into that. I'm sure there's a bunch of things I'll think of when we're done here that I could have asked you. Happens every time. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm sure we'll have, hopefully we'll have more cases to, to discuss next time as well. And um, there's a whole lot coming up, hopefully soon. One day, guys, Kevin Thompson's going to be retired. And be Clay Brewer who's the big shot. Yeah. One day, maybe one day. Right. That's the dream always. Right. But no, oh, I love working with, I love working you with know, Kevin. Just, just don't know. show Clay this. Clay, don't show Kevin this recording. No, no worries. We're all no, good. I love working with him and I hope he's, he's around working with us for a long time. He's a big proponent of the industry. Of course, uh, and he he knows his stuff uh, in and out. So it's it's a he sure does. So do you. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it. Likewise, I'll send you a copy of the recording, my friend. Yeah.